be here this evening. Uh, I am not a native to Texas, but uh, since Texas is defining the future of America, I guess we'll all be Texans soon enough. <laughs> but I'm pumped. So I just want to say that uh, I am grateful uh, for being invited this evening to participate in this incredible production. And I want to thank Teresa Coleman Walsh uh, for her creativity, for her leadership. <laughs> and of course, this is a hometown crowd in part, but as you heard earlier, she is the founding director of the Bishop Arts Theater. And so it is her hard labor and commitment to community theater that makes a production like this possible. And I also want to thank my uh, longtime friend and the director of this uh, incredible production, Gabrielle Kurlander, uh, who you saw earlier. I had, I had the good fortune of introducing a lot of people to a term that, uh, that I had not heard of, dramaturge. <laughs> which, is, which is a wonderful term because it can mean lots of different things. Uh, and in this role, I had a chance to read the plays, to give a little bit of feedback, and to contribute to some of the words on stage that you heard this evening. Um, now, I must say, I'm primarily a historian, uh, and so this kind of creative expression is not my stock and trade. Uh, but I was inspired by all of you uh, to contribute in this way. And, uh, and this has been a, a really uh, life-altering experience in many ways for me. So I want to thank all the playwrights directly. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to do two more things before we jump into it. I'm going to thank Nicole uh, for all that she's done to create this project in the first place. Uh, you heard a little bit about it at the beginning, and we're going to talk a lot more about it. But let's give it up for Nicole Hannah-Jones. <laughs> And then finally, um, I think the playwrights deserve the opportunity to at least name their plays because we want to, we've heard their names, but we haven't heard their plays. And if they want to make a statement about their work before we get started, that would be wonderful. So why don't we start and, and move uh, right to left? Hello, my name is Janelle Gray, and I wrote The Origin of Freedom. Hi, my name is Erin Malone-Turner, and I wrote Ingrained. Good evening. I'm Anika mcmillan Herod, and I wrote They Would Not Be Butchered. My name is Terrence Brooks-Boykin, and I wrote The Stand. My name is Aaron Zilberman, and I wrote Blacks, No Jews, No Dogs. All right, Nicole, so um, we want to all know um, how you came to create this project, uh, what was the inspiration, and any surprises along the way. Um, hey, Cleo. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. <laughs> uh, so cool to be here, and I also want to thank uh, Teresa Coleman Walsh for um, putting this all together. When I first heard about it, I was like, I have to be here because it, it really is an amazing thing to see um, the different creative ways that people can be inspired by a project and to see it take even another form. It's taken a lot of forms already, but this is a, a new form I haven't seen it in. So I've been really excited to see the interpretations and just have to give it up to you all. It was just it was, it was it was amazing. I really, really loved it. <laughs> Everything. And I actually, I, how, I don't know how much time we have, but I actually would love to just hear you all talk a little bit more about what you were inspired by in the book um, as you were producing these plays. Uh, some of them are more obvious than others, so I, I'm just really curious about that. And then I just have to correct for the record, I am not doctor anything. I have not earned a doctor. <laughs> I know I'm not, I, I'm not claiming the honorary doctorate. Um, 
I just, look, people work really hard to get a doctor in front of their name, and I'm not taking credit for anything that I haven't done, but I appreciate the upgrade in my credentials for sure. Um, <laughs> So I'll just, I'll just be quick on the origin because one, if you, if you buy the book, you can read it in the preface. Um, and also I've talked about it so much and I really, I really do wanna hear y'all talk as well. Um, but in many ways, you know, I talk about uh, being a, a high school student and taking a one semester black studies course um, before black studies courses were being banned all across the country. Um, and um, in that one semester of really learning more about the history of black people than I learned in my entire life up until then. And realizing as a 15 year old girl that uh, all those years when I grew up as a black girl thinking black people weren't in the story because we must not have done much um, for our teachers to teach us about. And then all of a sudden in this class I realized there was a whole lot that we could have been taught and people had decided it wasn't important enough or for whatever reasons that they didn't want to teach it to us. So I really became obsessed with learning the history and uh, Mr. Dow, who was my teacher in that class, uh, would give me books to read on my own and one of the books he gave me was Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett and that's when I read the date 1619. So you've heard this story a million times by now, Khalil, but uh, or Dr. Muhammad, um, <laughs> <laughs> he earned his. Um, but it really, you know, that date just stood out to me as both uh, a lineage, because it, it was powerful to me to know that black people had been here before the Mayflower, um, that our lineage in this country or the land that would become this country went back that far, but it also um, really stood in symbolically for an erasure and that 1619 happened, the white lion happened, but if you don't learn about it, it may as well have not happened. And that so much of what we think of as history is really memory. And it's what, what are we being taught to collectively remember and what are we being taught to collectively forget. So um, fast forward, you know, five, six years since I was in high school and are y'all tired? Y'all didn't even get my <laughs> joke. Or, or y'all really do it. believe I'm 20 years it. old. <laughs> One or the other. Um, but a few years, you know, I've, I've, I've spent my whole career in some ways trying to get us back to 1619, really believing that uh, so much about America cannot be fundamentally understood if we don't go back to that moment and that decision to engage in African slavery. Um, and so no matter what you're writing about today, which is really the conceit of the project, that you can look all across America and see these institutions that are being shaped by the legacy of slavery, we just don't acknowledge it, or we don't know it, or what's currently happening in Texas and Florida and all kinds of states is we want to suppress that. Um, so that was the inspiration. It was the 400th anniversary of uh, 1619, and we still hadn't grappled with how fundamental uh, slavery was, anti-blackness and black contributions were to the American story, but wasn't a 15-year-old girl in Waterloo, Iowa. I worked at the New York Times and I had the biggest megaphone in the world, so that's why. All right, all right. <laughs> so I'm gonna take Nicole's uh, encouragement and open the floor up to the playwrights to say, she, the first question that Nicole asked me before you joined the stage was, what was the inspiration behind the various plays? So uh, it'd be great if all of you could share, and I'm sure the audience would love it too. Being first, <laughs> Being first is rough, guys. Um, uh, yes, hi, I'm Janelle Gray. I wrote The Origin of Freedom. Um, I will say I actually uh, was in the process of writing a completely different play. Um, for this project, and as I was doing the research, I uh, found information about the White Declaration of Independence um, that I had never heard about, um, and then I in immediately called both of my parents and were like, did you guys know this thing happened? Um, and so uh, it, it kind of in that moment of, of knowing that this was just another thing that had been hidden after having read the book and all of the things and all of the ways that that um, you know this legacy um, has affected us and the lie that kind of was the Declaration of Independence. It made me want to go back and kind of challenge what they actually wrote um, and kind of uncover what actually happened with the hope that we can forge forward um, 
in, in the way that they actually said that they intended, so. Um, I wrote Ingrained, the alien play, and when I was, <laughs> when I was reading the 1619 book, I, there were a couple of different parts that inspired me and made me think a lot and then start just writing random notes. And then particularly the healthcare part made me start thinking about everything that our bodies have been through. And then that led me to not just my body, you know, here in 2022 at the time, but my mother, my grandmother, my great, great, like everyone before me and back and back and everything that we carry with us, which is why that idea is kind of where some of the lines in the play came from when Nola says, you know, you're acting like it happened directly to me, but everything that our people have been through lives in our DNA today and our bodies cannot forget and they carry, I was thinking about um, the effects of generational trauma and like just everything that this country has done to us instead of for us, even though we're the ones that built it. And so that's where most of the play came from. I wanted to make it funny because like, sh like she says, there were so many good things and there are really beautiful things about life um, and we've become more than what's happened to us, but we cannot forget, and I wanted to highlight the shock of slavery from outsiders, like true outsiders outside of the planet. Um, <laughs> and I love science fiction, so I just really wanted to write something strange and quirky and then ground it in the weight of what 1619 is really about. Thank you for writing 1619, so important. And so much of the book resonated with me. Um, if you know me, I'm not new to historical dramas and writing them, um, but I really wanted to explore a revolution. How does a revolution start? And that's what um, truly resonated with me in choosing uh, to focus on and, and imagine what, um, um, what a child who would become a part of the revolution 10 years later might be. So Cecile Fatima, um, it was dealing with the innocence that was engaged in enslavement. A lot of times we don't think children were there or just the innocence of just Africans being enslaved, period. Um, the brutality of uh, slavery um, in Haiti especially, you know, the lifespan was le less than, you know, maybe 25 years for most enslaved um, there. So I wanted to explore the horror of that, but the innocence that might have existed then, and then what uh, might have been the spark for uh, Cecile Fatima, who was the mamba who helped start the revolution. And I wanted to embrace um, um, African spirituality and how it's been demonized and how the Haitians have paid the price, <laughs> paid the price for revolution. And I've always admired you know, those ancestors. Um, so it was really an honoring of them and embracing all that we are in our strength. So the play that I wrote, The Stand, was really inspired by two chapters in the book, uh, Dispossession and Inheritance. Um, those chapters sort of really, really give you deep insight into you know, just the, the brutality and the savage way that the, this land that we're sitting on right now is stolen from the Native Americans. Um, it also talks about just how systematically, um, you know, people of African descent, you know, just the systems of racism have led to redlining um, our properties and our wealth being systematically taken from us. So I wanted to sort of really bring the relationships of the two sister-in-laws sort of like really inside to explore how, you know, racism and discussions about race and empowerment happen in lots of different spaces, not just at work and not just in society, but they can happen in your family. Um, and the importance of listening and the importance of us empowering ourselves to sort of stand our ground and address injustices, you know, in housing discrimination. So those were the kinds of things that I was, you know, my intention was really to sort of really just layer those things to address inequities in housing 
And you know, it's really, really current right now, especially with the way that uh, black families are having to struggle to be treated fairly. When, you know, when they um, for the, their home appraisals or you know when they get ready to sell their homes all around the country. So that really stood, you know, stood out for me. Um, my play was very much inspired by, primarily by the chapter called Race, additionally the, the chapter on fear. Um, the, there was a line, I, I'm, I'm not going to say it speci like accurately enough, but it, it said something along the lines of, we've grown so accustomed to uh, identifying ourselves by race in America that we don't even think twice about it. We're asked on so many documents, so many forms, what is our race? And we don't think about it, we just fill it out. Um, and it's always been a little uncomfortable for me, that, that process. And I've, I've sat back and watched and listened to so many people have a discussion about what my race is, because I'm a white Jew, Jew in America. Am I white? Am I Jewish? And it what I attempted to do, what I wanted to do, was highlight the absurdity of the concept of race. And how, how it shifts constantly from society to society, from, from time to time. Race changes, the, con the who, who is what and what their label is. So that was my, my initial spark. And from a personal experience, I wanted to highlight the, the ongoing dialogue that I've, I've listened to my entire life between blacks and Jews and this, this almost love-hate relationship, this, the resentment, the, the togetherness, the, the fear, the anger, the and there's so much there. And so I would say my, my primary purpose in, in writing this play was to initiate a dialogue. And I know I've, I've, I have upset a few people, and that's fine. <laughs> um, great art does that, good art does that. Um, and so that's, that's my purpose. I want to, I want to initiate a dialogue on this. Yeah, cause I, I definitely wanted to have some dialogue about that one. I bet there's a lot, <laughs> <laughs> probably a lot of people in this room want to have some conversation about that one. I mean, I'm not going to, I just want to. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I'm struck by is, uh, and I'm, this question I'm directing to you, Nicole, is it's like you create something, as you say, a kind of record of the past that enters into public consciousness, has the potential to reshape collective memories about that past, and already the book has moved into playwrights, their ideas, their experiences, their concerns. Isn't this exactly why the book's been banned in so many states already? That's a rhetorical question. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I just think about even in my own origin story of the origin story of the project was a 15-year-old black girl who got a class that taught her her history and it radicalized her and she one day came and produced the 6019 Project, right? So you realize the power of us all having this greater, uh, deeper, more skeptical understanding is it leads more people to question. It leads more people to um, explore. Um, there's a reason that I've been writing about racial inequality for two decades. And it was only when I did a project that tried to unsettle our memory, right, our collective narrative that all of white power like aligned against me in the project, right? Like legislative bans, 18, the 1836 project, which your governor put in place to, I guess, commemorate when Texas is formed as a slaveholding republic. Um, so yes, I, I think it, are y'all clapping for that or? <laughs> They're clapping about the collective outrage. <laughs> 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 I mean, look, I, no, I know, I know. I, I just crack jokes because it gets tense up in here talking all this, <laughs> all this race stuff. I got I to gotta crack jokes every once in a while, but, um, which is why I appreciated the humor in your sis because it is. Humor is how we survive dealing with all this ugliness um, 
and, and yes, the collective traumas. You you have to you have to have that joy and be able to see the absurdity um, and everything that we've gone through. So anyway, long story. Yes, right. Of course, um, to see that we can inspire this type of dialogue amongst people. I mean, that really is what ultimately became the power of the 1619 Project is, uh, as you know, it's not that radical. Um, the ideas aren't really that radical. The scholarship is, that it's built upon has been around for decades, um, but it hadn't necessarily permeated the, the collective understanding, the, the non-academic understanding, the popular understanding. And that's seen as dangerous because then it inspires all types of other introspection and all types of dialogue. And why would power want that? Right, because the, the understanding we have of America that we're all indoctrinated into uh, rationalizes and legitimizes racial hierarchy, economic hierarchy, gender hierarchy, um, and we know who benefits from that. And we know what happens. I mean, I became a journalist because I believe the narrative drives policy. And we have one narrative of America that allows us to support really regressive, stingy, individualistic policy. But if we learned a different narrative of America, we would support different policies that would make us a more just society. And the people who benefit from the society being as fractured, as divided, as unequal as it is, don't want that. So yes, I think that's clearly why, uh, why it's being banned. And particularly, we are at a very uh, nervous moment for a um, segment of the white population who feels that they are losing their demographic supremacy, which means they fear they're losing their political supremacy. And they see what happened in 2020 when, for this brief moment, because we always knew it was going to be brief, right? Racial reckonings, well, we're in another racial reckoning, but it's in the opposite direction of the one we are trying to go to in 2020, is that you saw people taking on this lexicon of systems, that it wasn't just about this one white cop murdering this one black man, but about a society that lets this white cop know that I can murder this black man with people filming it and probably nothing will happen to me, right? Society produces that moment. And so people were doing this critique and they were using 1619 as the lexicon. They were painting 1619 on monuments to enslavers and bigots as they were snatching them down. They were saying this is a 400 year old struggle and that's dangerous to the hierarchy wants to say we're all equal, so where black people struggle, it's because of black pathology, it's because of black cultural deficit, it has nothing to do with a system designed to produce the results over you know, 350 years. So 1619 and then this larger propaganda campaign that we all call critical race theory, that's not, but um, exists to push back on that, right, to, to take the white folks who are starting to feel like maybe it's going a little too far. Maybe, maybe this, you know, I was, I was down for the don't kill black people in the street. I'm not so much down for the larger structural critique of America. Maybe it's gone too far. Um, it becomes very useful because the oldest wedge issue in America is race. We're primed for it. Um, it was interesting. The George Wallace was which one? Don't call me Shirley. Who, whose was that one? Oh, oh that playwright's not here. Um, because George Wallace is like, he, he's such a great, he like epitomizes that. He, he wasn't actually that racist, right? When he, when he ran, originally he runs as a racial moderate and he gets his ass kicked. And then he realizes, oh, I know how to win. I, I run as a racist and, and then he wins. And you see, this, you see this with Nixon, like you see this again and again um, where Politicians understand if you want to win politically in a polarized society, all you have to do is go to race. Um, and so, yes, all these bands are coming from that. That was a long answer. No, it was Sorry. a great answer. <laughs> I mean, one of, the, one of the things I'm struck by, and Nicole touched on this, is that the, the project in its earliest days had a direct impact on how people made sense of the George Floyd moment. And I know in this moment, it, and I can certainly speak for myself, it is hard not to be discouraged by the unrelenting way in which each week brings new legislative efforts 
to destroy any, any effort to achieve equity in this society um, in the 21st century, to, to make good on whatever failed promises didn't happen in previous centuries or decades for that matter. But if we wanna lean into, I think, what this play suggests to us and the power of performance and creativity and imagination, then the 1619 Project, even in its earliest days, showed that power also. People were quoting it from Congress. Cory Booker mentioned it in a discussion about reparations. Uh, there were school board hearings around the country, not the ones to ban it, but the ones to adopt it. And I think, I mean, for me in this moment, and I'd be curious, Nicole, how you think, how, at least how you advise others, I mean, this to me is a moment literally of standing your ground. It, it is a moment not to retreat, not to be silent. I am beyond frustra frustrated with this notion that the way out of this moment is to keep solving for what resentful, hateful white people need in order to be okay with us. Not really a question in there, but a response. So I wanted to share st Stan, I'm terrible with names, so the playwright of Stan, tell us your name, Terrence, Terrence. So when I, uh, when I saw it perform tonight, I couldn't help but remember the, the New York Times news story of Nathan Connolly and Shawnee Mott, two professors at Johns Hopkins. You want to tell this story, Nicole? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you must have written this play before that because, okay, so some of you know this story, but here is a black couple in Baltimore in an upscale neighborhood. They have two small children. Um, he happens to be a historian. His wife is also an academic. Um, they are very committed to educating their own children about black history and black diasporic history. They start a family YouTube channel during COVID uh, to sort of have something productive to do and also to share these stories. At some point they decide we also want to renovate our house. They get an appraisal company to come out. They get pre-approved for a loan up to a certain amount, but the appraisal has to happen in order to make sure that there's enough equity in the house for this future loan. The appraisal comes in at something like $472,000, which doesn't actually mean they're gonna get the loan because it's not enough, the value of the house. They're confused, troubled by this, and suspect that the appraiser had made an assessment based on their race. They decide to do exactly what your play suggests. They're gonna whitewash the house. They remove all the black art, all the black books. They hire a colleague who's white. And by the way, Dr. Connolly happens to be a historian of racist real estate practices. <laughs> <laughs> so his suspicions are well informed by experience and knowledge. The appraiser comes in, they're not home, white guy stands in, house is scrubbed clean. All right, first person to guess this correctly gets a free book from me. What's the appraisal come in at? All right, I haven't heard it. I haven't heard it. But, but you're, you're all right in that a lot more. The amount was $750,000. Oh, you said it? Uh-oh. Oh, good Lord. All right. Give that sister her book. Right there? All right. We'll exchange information. $750,000. The tragedy in this is obvious, but even more so than that, the moment for them to capitalize on the market when they set in motion this meant fundamentally that wealth was taken from them because the interest rates had changed, they had to go through legal maneuvers, they can't actually get the money that they were, would have been promised had they been white in that moment when they initiated the transaction. 
And just in case anyone's wondering, the justification that the appraiser came back with initially was that a black neighborhood proximate to where they lived was more appropriate a comparison for their home than the white neighborhood they actually lived in. <laughs> you can't make that's, this stuff that's up. That's America. I mean, I, I would just like to point out that the fact that not one person in the room offered a lower number on the appraisal. Right. Seriously though, right? This is how we know race is real. Because we're in a society that tries to tell us we're just making this shit up, right? It's not, it's not actually real. But we all know how it works. And we all know not a single person in here thought that when you made the house appear like it belonged to a white person versus a black person, that the appraisal would go down. We all knew it would go up significantly. That's race. Right, that's caste, and this is what black folks are, are up against. Um, I mean, this is why I even talks of reparations when people are like home ownership. That's not gonna work for us. Our homes in black neighborhoods are worth less. Our homes don't appreciate as quickly unless white people start moving in the neighborhood, right? Like we still have dual systems. Um, and that's the whole argument of the book, is that the greatest thing that um, white people in general achieved after the civil rights movement is to now act like race is about individuals and that the systems have been banished without actually banishing the systems, which is why they don't want to talk about critical race theory because that's literally what critical race theory says, which is actually just common sense, but whatever. So I have one last, I have one last question, um, and it's, uh, it's open-ended for, for Nicole, and I'll give uh, anyone else an opportunity uh, if they uh, would like to share something. So many of you probably know that the 1619 Project has now been uh, transformed into a docu-series that's running on Hulu, and there's been several episodes. So how many people have seen? I'm gonna need some more hands to be raised <laughs> by the time we ask this tomorrow. We need, we need those streams. So, so really, it's a pretty straightforward question, Nicole. Um, now that you're also a filmmaker, what have you learned about yourself and the importance of this work in translating the book to this format? Mm. And I'll just, I'll prompt you by saying, um, I knew about your father, I didn't know about your mother and your grandparents, mm. and I thought it was very powerful, uh, a reveal, and, and I don't want to get too personal here, but I'll ask the question. I mean, it's in the documentary now. So. No, uh, no, no, but it's not about the fact that your mother is white and all of that. I mean, that's in the documentary. The question was the extent to which you intentionally chose not to write that into the democracy essay, either mm. in its first or second versions, because I think it changes. It certainly doesn't change how racism works, right? Because black people are, by definition, a people of hybridity. Um, but, but the power of it in, in that uh, episode of the series, I think, is, is if race, the, the, the episode on race is even more powerful. And I just, I wanted to know how intentional you were about leaving it out or putting it in. Um, I never even considered talking about that um, in democracy because democracy was really about, um, how black people make sense of the country that we built and our place in it. And um, in the race episode, well, actually, let me, let, let me go back. I, that narrative arc of the race episode where I talk about uh, my father's mother being born in 1924 in Greenwood, Mississippi, my mother's father being born in 1924, white man in Iowa, um, and how everything about their lives would be determined by the racial categories and the gender categories on their birth certificates. Um, that was, I wrote that into the preface of the book, but the preface was, ended up doing too many things and we ultimately took that out of the preface um, because part of it as I was, you know, the, the, the preface is an origin to the project but it's also like my origin, how did I come to do the project? And certainly, growing up in a biracial family and having intimacy um, with race in that way, um, 
and seeing one, how false it was, but also how real it was at the same time. And seeing that, you know, my white family was not working harder than my black family. And they were also working class, but they had land and they own their homes. So working class for them didn't look like working class for my black side of my family. So all of that was shaping my understanding of race and the world and where I fit and, you know, having a father who's like, your mom is white, but you're not. You're black, and you're gonna be treated like it was very clear. Um, so yes, I, it wasn't, I never thought about it for the democracy essay. It was originally going to be part of the preface. So as we were doing the race episode, I shared those sections with the producers, and I was like, this is how we have to get into this episode um, in that way. So yeah. yeah well, it's incredible, it works really well. I mean, not just because it's your story, but because it's a powerful intervention um, and also just simply reminds uh, people that race was always about power. Always. And so it, it, did, it never had to make sense. It just had to work. <laughs> so any parting thoughts, folks, and share? Well, we have not thanked the actors yeah. again, so I want to thank. <laughs> I just want to say thank you all again for coming out tonight. I want to thank the All Stars family, all the folks from all over the country who support the All Stars, uh, who are uh, producers and contributors to this production. Uh, this is a real treat, and I'm grateful for having had the chance to be here tonight. I want to thank all of the playwrights. I want to thank Nicole Hannah Jones and our lovely, wonderful host, Teresa Walsh. Thank you so much. Okay, guys, if you have your books, we'll meet you in the lobby. I'd like for the actors to join us on stage. We're going to do a quick photo op, really quickly. Can we give Nicole Hannah-Jones and Dr. Khalil Muhammad and these beautiful playwrights and the cast a round of applause?